Hi everyone, this is going to be a very quick and informal explanation of a method for finding roots of polynomials. Now, of course, I implemented this in code so you can check it out on GitHub. This is going to be a very computational and math heavy video. What we're going to do is talk about um, what the method is, and then I'm going to show you a bit of the code and show you how fast it is. But first, some prerequisites. It will be helpful to know what a polynomial is because we're going to be talking about polynomials. Now, second, we're going to be talking about derivatives. Only a very basic understanding of this is important. You don't need to have taken high school calculus or anything. Um, just knowing what a derivative is, or at least how to find the derivative of a polynomial. Number three, we're going to be using binary search. So I'm going to be explaining what binary search actually is, so you don't need to have lots of familiarity with it. All right, now let's outline what exactly we're trying to do. So here's the problem. Uh, say we have a polynomial, any polynomial at all. It can be of any degree, hopefully not constant, um, but it would work. Actually, it wouldn't work for constants, but let's just assume we have a polynomial here. Um, our goal is to find the real roots of this polynomial. So here we have three real roots. Um, this might be, say, x squared plus 2x minus 13 plus 10, um, and it would have roots at x equals negative 5, 1, and 2. Sorry, I meant to say 13x plus 10, and this is x squared. Now our goal is to do this for any arbitrary polynomial and to find the real roots within a decent precision. I'm going to be outlining a rather inefficient algorithm. There exist algorithms to do this already, but I'm just talking about one specific one. So first I'm going to talk about real root isolation and what exactly that is and how it will help. And specifically, this will use binary search. And then I'm going to go into the details of how we do the real root isolation and why exactly it works. So first of all, real root isolation, what is this? Well, first of all, there is a Wikipedia page on this. So a lot of research has been done on this already, so I'm not going to be able to tell you the most up-to-date stuff. But from what I understand, real root isolation is taking a polynomial and isolating its real roots. Basically what this is, is you're finding intervals on the real number line, or rather just the x-axis, because we're talking about single variable polynomials here. You're going to be finding intervals on the x-axis that each contain exactly one real root, and no more, no less. Now the goal of real root isolation is of course to find the real roots, and I'm sure the Wikipedia page outlines a bunch of ways to find the roots once you have these intervals, but uh, I haven't read through it, so I'm just going to link to this down below. Basically I'm just saying people have done this before, but we're going to be doing a specific type of real root isolation. What we're going to be doing is finding intervals where one side of the interval is negative and one side of the interval is positive. And in that way, we will be able to do binary search on these intervals. So if you have an interval where the polynomial crosses the x-axis, so it goes from positive to negative or goes from a negative to positive, um, and this is just a really zoomed in version. So if you have the interval like here to here, you know the polynomial is positive on one side of the interval and negative on the other side, then you can do a binary search on these two intervals, finding the midpoints, and then just continuing to evaluate uh, whether each side is positive or negative. I'll go into more detail on this, but if you're familiar with binary search, you know that if we have a positive side of the polynomial and a negative side of the polynomial, you can find the root that is in between them. Okay, now let's talk about how we find these intervals and why they actually must work. So consider any root of this polynomial. I'm gonna start not drawing the y-axis because it's a bit annoying. If you have any root of this polynomial, then either, there are two types, either it bounces off the x-axis like that, so it's kind of tangent to the x-axis and like that, or it crosses the x-axis cleanly like that. Now, if it bounces off the x-axis, that's sort of an edge case we'll handle later. Most of them will probably cross the x-axis. And this means on one side it is positive, and on the other side it is negative. So let's draw a little section of that right here. Um, on one side it's positive, on the other side it's negative locally. Let's assume that this root is not one of the most extreme roots. So it's not the greatest root, nor is it the smallest root. Uh, let's look to the left and see where the next smallest root is, because we assumed it's not one of the extremes, there must be a root somewhere here. So if you continue the graph, it must come down and cross the x-axis again to hit that other root. And on the other end, there must be a root that is greater than this current root, and the graph must go below the x-axis and then come back up to touch that further root. Now the great thing about this is since the graph on the left is going up and then coming back down, it must obtain a maximum point, and on the right, since it's going down and coming back up, it must contain a minimum point. 
Intuitively, you know this is true. Uh, every root, if it's not the largest or the smallest, is going to have a minimum and a maximum on either side of it. But I'm not going to go into too rigorous a proof of this because I think that's going to be too difficult and too time consuming for a single YouTube video. Now consider what happens when we have um, something bouncing off the x-axis and it's tangent. Well, then it's probably going to be, well, most definitely going to be a local minimum or maximum itself. So we will consider the roots itself as one of the intervals inevitably. So that's sort of an edge case. Uh, it doesn't matter too much, but our algorithm will handle it just fine. And now let's consider what happens when we do have one of the extreme roots. So let's say we have the root here. It does cross the x-axis, um, but on this side, there's no root to come back up to. It just keeps going down to infinity. Um, and there might be some weird stuff that happens in between. We don't care too much about that. Um, we know on the right that it must have a local minimum or maximum to go to. Uh, in this case, we're assuming it goes from negative to positive as x increases. So let's just say it has a local maximum on the right. On the left, we need a definition for this interval, right? We can't just say negative infinity is our lower bound because then we can't do binary search. So what we're going to do is we're going to start at its right's most local maximum, and then we're going to look at the left minus two or minus one, and we're going to look to the left minus two, and then we're going to look to the left minus four, and then minus eight, and then we're just gonna keep going like that, doubling how far we're looking to the left each time. Eventually, we will hit a value of x that is negative when plugged into the polynomial, and we can just use that as our endpoint. Um, the reason we're going exponentially is because it's faster than going incrementally by like a constant value. We'll probably hit a value of x that obtains an opposite sign when plugged into the polynomial, pretty fast because exponential functions grow really fast. You might think um, of this like we might have a local maximum here and then it just really slowly goes down and hits the x-axis. This is totally possible for a polynomial. We would start at this point. We might look to the left one and then two and then eight and then 16 and then 32 and then 64 and then we will have hit uh, a value of x that is negative. So Basically, this is our approximation for negative infinity. We'll be able to construct an interval just fine, even if the root is the lowest or highest, and there's no minimum or maximum um, to both sides. Uh, here's another extreme case. If you just have a polynomial that looks like this, this happens usually for odd degree polynomials. In this case, what we would do is we would just start at zero, wherever zero is, and then we'd look at negative one, negative two, whatever, etc., and look at one, two, etc., four, eight, and get an interval that way. So one side is negative, the other side is positive. So this algorithm works just fine, even if we have a polynomial that doesn't have any local minimum or maximums. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, this is all great, but what if we have some local minima and maximum that don't cross the x-axis between them? In that case, we just wouldn't consider them at all. So let's say we've determined an interval is here and here, an interval is here and here, here and here, here and here, and here, and somewhere over there. Um, because those are the local minima and maxima. In this interval specifically, this interval doesn't contain any roots because both of the endpoints have the same sign. So in general, whenever we end up with a minimum and a maximum that have the same sign, they're not gonna have a root between them. So that's the explanation for why real root isolation will work in our case. The question is how do we actually identify the minimum and maximum of a polynomial? This is where the inefficiency of the algorithm comes in. So let's say we have a polynomial f of x. We're going to take its derivative. Now, hopefully you know how to take derivatives of polynomials. It's just using the power rule. You bring down the exponent um, and then minus it by 1. But the derivative of our polynomial um, is going to maybe look something like this. It's going to be positive, 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 hitting 0, negative, 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 and then positive, 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 and then negative and then positive and then negative and then positive. Um, basically the points where it intersects zero are going to be our local minima and maxima because the derivative is defined as the sort of slope of a function. We're dealing with one variable calculus for now. And the points where the slope is equal to zero is exactly where the minima and maximum are. So when the derivative is equal to zero, we know we have a minimum or a maximum. Now, how do we actually find the roots? We use recursion. So we use the same recursive function, the same algorithm that we're using to find the roots of the current polynomial to find the roots of the derivative. And you might say, hey, that's circular reasoning. We're using the same algorithm to do the algorithm, um, but it's actually not, it's recursion because the degree of the derivative decreases by one every time we run the algorithm. So we're all good. 
eventually we will hit the base case of finding the roots of a linear polynomial and this is all very easy because if we have it in the form um, f of x is ax plus b then we know the root is going to be negative b over a okay once we have our intervals of this polynomial and we know that every interval has a negative and a positive sign or vice versa this polynomial crosses the x-axis at some point in between. Now we can actually determine where the root lies inside this interval. If you're familiar with binary search, you know what this is already, and you got it when I talked about this briefly at the start of the video. But basically, we're going to be keeping track of two pointers, low and high. They will always have differing signs when evaluated with the polynomial. Low is going to be always negative, and high is going to be always positive, in this case, or vice versa. But we're just going to stick with this example without loss of generality. The algorithm goes like this. We're going to look at the midpoint between low and high. So we're going to look at this x value. If it is positive, then we are going to set high equal to the midpoint to keep that negative positive um, difference between the two ends of the interval. Um, but if it's negative, and in this case it is, then we're going to set low to that value. So now low is going to equal mid. This maintains the negative positive difference in signs between the two ends of the interval. Now mid is going to be still the average of low and high and let's say it's like over here. It's still negative so we're going to again update low to be equal to mid. Now we take the mid again but this time it's positive when evaluated with the polynomial. So we're going to take the high value and set that to mid. During this whole process, we are maintaining the difference in signs between the two ends of the interval again, and we're just narrowing it around that singular root. The reason we can do this is because the function is monotonically increasing between the original uh, ends of the interval. And the reason for this is probably, well, it's pretty intuitive because we identified all the local minima and maxima. So there's absolutely no way for this function to have any confusing properties in between. It's going to be increasing or decreasing if it goes from positive to negative. Great, so we can do binary search on all our intervals um, if an interval does contain a root. Again, if an interval starts out as both positive on both ends or both negative on both ends, then we're not going to consider it. And that's basically it. Um, as a summary of our algorithm, we're gonna take any polynomial at all, we're going to identify its minima and maxima using recursion on its derivative. So these are going to be its local minima and maxima. For the extremes, so for positive infinity and negative infinity, we're just going to approximate the value of infinity and look to the left until we get a value that is the opposite sign of the next closest minima or maxima. And in this way, we will have constructed a bunch of intervals that each contain a minima and a maxima or a maxima and a minima. Inside every interval, they will have roots that we can find with binary searching. And if both signs of either end of the interval are equal, then we don't consider that interval at all. In that way, we will have identified all the real roots of the polynomial, no matter where they are. So with that bit done, let's take a look at the code. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because there's definitely not enough time in this video, but I might do a walkthrough in a future video, so let me know in the comments if you would like that. Basically, this file contains all the relevant code, it contains some utility functions like determining the sign of a number, uh, finding the derivative of a polynomial. We're going to use list to represent polynomials where each element of the list is the coefficient of the corresponding term. Now here is where the actual bulk of the program is. It's in finding the roots. We're going to be finding the derivative and recursively finding the roots of the derivative. We're going to be identifying all these intervals and then looking at the signs, doing binary search, all that good stuff. And then I wrote some tests because that's what all pro good programs should do, right? So here's a test for the program. You can see um, I'm comparing it to NumPy's root finding algorithm and my algorithm is considerably slower. So you can see it's executing 1000 total tests on polynomials of degree 10 with integer coefficients between negative 10 and 10 and each run is taking 0 0.02 seconds. So that's pretty much it for the explanation of this algorithm. The code and relevant links will be in the description below. Let me know down below if you have any questions or clarifications to make. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching.